Welcome everybody to this webinar organized by the Green European Foundation and the Flemish think tank Oikos. I'm Dirk Holemans, co-president of the foundation and your host today. This webinar is also the formal start of our Just Transition project, a transnational project of the Green European Foundation that allows green foundations from different countries from Europe to work together on this challenge. So I'm very happy that next to, let's say, the general public to also have my colleagues here with me from Spain, Croatia, UK, North Macedonia and Serbia. Now, why do, you do we find just transition as a concept, as a movement, as a goal so important? Well, because it is a challenge. We all know that the transition to a climate neutral economy is necessary. But this involves much more than just the application of new green technologies. It's also about changes in the kind of jobs that will be available or not. Change, there will be choices, and these choice, choices will decide which groups will benefit. And if bad choice, choices are made, some people will suffer from the transition. But the choice we as Green Family want to make is clear. We need a new economic system that takes care of the planet, that takes care of the people, and in which all costs and benefits are distributed in a fair way. This, of course, raises a lot of questions. How do we, for instance, transform in a sustainable way our labor market? Uh, how do you make sure the transition to renewables is inclusive? Um, how do we make sure that different regions in Europe can uh, are not left behind? Now, to introduce this concept of just transition, I'm very happy that we have uh, a very inspiring speaker today, Bela Galgotsky. He's senior researcher at the European Trade Union Institute in his talk. Bela will explain to us what just transition really means and also which current developments there are now going on. He will also give some examples from the world of work. So Bela will talk about 30 minutes, but divide it in two parts. First, a more general introduction. Then there's room for questions. And then a second part with two concrete examples. Now, in meanwhile, while you are listening, you already can put your questions in the chat box. And it would be very nice if you mention from which country you are. So we really can see how European this webinar is. And then I will collect the questions for the Q&A. So this is a bit how it will go. And so I now invite Bela to Bela, give his presentation. Give his presentation. So, um... Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Bea Gaguzzi, uh, as said, European uh, Trade Union Institute in Brussels. Uh, I'm originally coming from Hungary, uh, as you see from my name, uh, and uh, but I'm here for 16 years now. And in the last uh, 10 years, uh, one of my focus uh, research uh, topics is uh, climate change and uh, uh, yeah, the transition. Uh, also, uh, from a employment and workers' uh, point of view. So, I would like to introduce now the the, the concept. Uh, we know that we have a climate emergency. Uh, I don't want to make to have too much details on why it is an emergency. There is a lot of scientific evidence for that and newer and newer evidence is coming up underlying, underlying that we are already too late. We have 10, year, 10 years of a carbon budget. Uh, and uh, so it's kind of indeed an urgency to go down to zero carbon economy uh, by uh, 2050. And that means that our whole production system and the way we consume and live 
needs to be transformed. And indeed, that has costs. It has a sacrifice. There are winners and losers. Um, we also have now the uh, European Green Deal uh, that at least uh, shows that it is getting to be serious also at the uh, European level, and it is kind of an unprecedented uh, initiative. Uh, I will then um, introduce the just transition, the concept, the origins, because I think it's still interesting to, to see how it emerged. Uh, uh, then, then also how trade unions deal with it. It is not that easy. Uh, and then, uh, then, uh, yeah, also talk about a little bit on uh, employment and regional and distributional effects because that is kind of the underlying um, uh, issue uh, behind uh, just transitions. And then we would have uh, case examples. Uh, and what I also. Uh, yes, so the clock is ticking, uh, and there is no vaccine for climate change. And and this is why I would really mention the link. We all are now in an absolutely unprecedented situation with this health crisis. Uh, and our life changed from one day to another. Uh, and we live in this situation for more than two months already and we don't know where the end is. Uh, this is, of course, another emergency, and it is very serious now. Uh, there are common features between the two emergencies. Uh, the one is that in both, we have an exponential increase of a hazard that is hitting a limited resource. The limited resource, on the one hand, is the planet the planetary boundaries. The limited resource, on the other hand, is the healthcare system uh, that actually can even be expanded, but the planet cannot be expanded. Um, so that is uh, one. Uh, the other important thing I would mention right here that, that uh, uh, the responsibility of the state and the role of the state. We saw in this current health emergency that with a huge turn, suddenly, uh, the state and the governments became the central institutions to guide and control this process. It is an unprecedented intervention into production, into consumption, into movements. This would never be accepted in context of the climate change. At the same time, we also know that the climate change doesn't pose such a direct threat because we don't feel that our life is in immediate danger. It is in danger, and uh, probably many more lives are in danger in the longer term, but it is in the longer term, and it is not direct. It is not necessarily happening here. It is happening somewhere else. So the link is much more blurred and then we don't feel the emergency. So one lesson is, of course, that uh, we certainly need uh, uh, a role of a uh, more pronounced role of the state in guiding also the uh, uh, climate emergency and the climate policy uh, uh, issue. So that will be one. And, and the second important thing I would underline now that, that what we are confronted with now that there is a crisis and employment emergency at the same time, because millions of jobs are in jeopardy now. Uh, this is certainly not the way how the climate emergency should be tackled. We always uh, denied and wanted to avoid that there is an environment jobs dilemma, and it, there shouldn't be one. But in order not to have a climate, uh, and a climate jobs dilemma, we need the just transition concept. Uh, so this is why the current situation also shows why the ju just transition concept is so important. Some, it's important to mention that getting to zero carbon uh, means 
a really radical correction of, of uh, how we are cutting emissions. Uh, it needs to be much more than what we had been doing in the last 30 years. So if you see on these graphs, the, the uh, um, bold um, uh, black line is the actual uh, cuts, and then the dotted lines showing down to the zero uh, is where we have to go. So first of all, the first part is simply the target, but, but then down at uh, 2050, uh, this is where really we have to go. So this means it is going to be much steeper. And, and, and this has a consequence because that means that, uh, that uh, climate policy needs to be much more ambitious. Uh, we need much more investment and the effects on jobs and livelihoods will be also much harsher. So what we experienced in the last uh, 30 years, it is just a foretaste of what is coming. Uh, so uh, that's why, again, it's important that, uh, that um, uh, we take up uh, the just transition approach. Uh, I don't uh, make uh, any further comment on the European uh, uh, Green Deal. Uh, one thing is, of course, important here that it's a very ambitious investment project. project. Uh, we do not, do not exactly know yet where exactly the money will be coming and how exactly it will be coming. There is much leverage here and promises and, and uh, with some uncertainties, uh, but let's hope that uh, it will be materializing. And then uh, important also to see that there is um, um, what is called uh, the just transition mechanism that is part of this, um, this um, uh, a process and it's important that is an integral part of the uh, policy framework. So, uh, so just transition is about fair or just burden sharing uh, of all the um, costs and burdens uh, that come with uh, this very ambitious transformation. Uh, and it is in the origins, it is roughly 30 years now that we have the just transition concept. It emerged in North America in the 1980s and in the 1990s, international trade unions like the forerunner of the ITUC was picking up this um, concept and, and pushing it uh, to international um, uh, uh, well, um, fora. Uh, at the Kyoto conference, then, then, then later at the COP, uh, at the Cancun COP, and then the Paris COP, uh, it became an integral element of, of now uh, the international uh, uh, climate policy framework, so to say. Uh, so the, for the origins, there was always one, one route was environmental justice. Environmental justice in the sense that, that uh, environmental hazards are certainly destroying nature, the soil, the atmosphere. Uh, at the same time, they are an imminent threat to people, people and workers. And it was also recognized that the way it is affecting people is very unequal. It is always the vulnerable groups that are hit more. And even there was um, a discrimination element of that, uh, that vulnerable groups were always much harder hit by environmental hazards. And they were always the ones that are less responsible for that. So this was the environmental justice part. Uh, the climate justice uh, element was uh, developing in the global north and global south dimension. Uh, recognizing that, that uh, it was the expansionist capitalist production model of the global north since the Industrial Revolution that was, uh, well, uh, pushing this model and was responsible for the historical emissions, while at the same time the global south and the poorer societies are paying the price, they are much more affected and they are much less prepared for that, although they have no responsibility. So this, this asymmetry 
of responsibilities and effects uh, was uh, than that with, uh, the, with the climate justice. The climate justice uh, narrative was then expanded uh, to take up uh, how the climate policies that are necessary, uh, how these climate policies are affecting uh, different people, different income groups. And again, it is the vulnerable that are actually affected more, not only by climate change itself, but by the climate policies. Uh, in terms of employment and in terms of, of price, energy price, carbon price. Uh, and and that, that uh, gave, uh, made it important to, to have uh, concrete policies that deal with these uh, distributional effects on the one hand and uh, with the employment effects because the employment Actually, it is often argued that there, it is a, probably a net positive game uh, going to zero carbon with the new technologies, new um, uh, uh, energy system. Uh, there is a job creation effect of that. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that uh, jobs are disappearing in certain sectors and most of the jobs are being transformed. So there is a huge pressure on employment in, in, as a result, and this needs uh, to be uh, tackled. So that means that if a coal mine or a coal um, uh, uh, plant is being closed down, it is not the coal miner or this employee that is responsible for that. Uh, they need to have a perspective. They need to have, even if their jobs are lost, uh, they need, uh, first of all, an income security, and then they need a perspective. Uh, that means training uh, uh, and, and an active um, uh, job counseling, uh, active uh, support uh, into a new, uh, well, green employment world. And that, uh, also, um, is, that is also true to regions because there are entire regions that are dependent on energy intensive industries and what comes after. So uh, uh, we also recognize that there is no uh, jobs environment uh, dilemma per se. There is no inherent conflict, but uh, in real life situation, it can appear and it needs to be addressed. Uh, uh, once more, uh, from a functional perspective on, for the just transition, we can see it has a part that is um, focused on the outcome because we have a vision uh, of where this process is going. It is a zero carbon economy, but a zero carbon economy that is inclusive with less inequality than we have now. And where uh, jobs are not only green, but jobs are good, well paid, secure, and unionized if possible. Uh, because as we know that many of the jobs that are actually on disappearing were relatively good jobs and organized jobs. So the mining, the steel industry, the automobile industry, they were all well-paying, safe jobs and uh, unionized jobs. Uh, and it needs to be, um, uh, yeah, happen like that in the future. The process. Uh, is the second important uh, element of the just transition concept. And this is how we get there. And this is about the transition itself, a managed transition where nobody is left behind with just burden sharing and uh, managing the social impacts. Uh, revitalize local economies and as uh, said also um, actively uh, managing the employment uh, transitions. It is absolutely crucial. Uh, so, uh, and it is not an abstract concept, uh, but it is a real, there are real practices in real workplaces. And this is why there might be conflicts because real workplaces, as we know, are not ideal. They are not free of conflict. 
they are uh, uh, well can be characterized by the capital labor uh, relationship or conflict. Uh, we know that it's precarious work and and uh, working conditions uh, that are hard uh, that we see normally at workplaces. So if in this environment you need to have a fundamental change, it will bring more pressure on the individual workplaces. Even in those cases, if, if uh, jobs are not being uh, under threat. Uh, and you need to manage this process in a way that is, uh, well, uh, not going um, against the interest of workers. And this is where social dialogue uh, is key. Uh, and um, it is also true that, uh, that the concept of just transition is uh, multifaceted. It is, it is it has become very broad and wide uh, and it really depends on the concrete uh, uh, strategies and the concrete actions. And certainly it is very much uh, depending on the institutional frameworks of societies. A just transition in Norway looks totally different than a just transition in South Africa. Uh, within Europe, we see also big differences, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, etc. So it must be, just transition must be adopted, must be applied, implemented into uh, the uh, concrete uh, social and economic uh, uh, realities uh, of countries. And uh, this is the underground perspective. Uh, there is no silver bullet, there is no general uh, uh, solution that you have to do it like that. There are certain guidelines, the ILO uh, 2015 guidelines are very helpful for that. Uh, uh, how, what are the basic and most important elements of, uh, of uh, just transition? Um, but we also see uh, that, that um, different sectors of the economy uh, have very different characteristics and peculiarities, vulnerabilities and opportunities. And so just transition in the coal sector looks, for example, quite differently than in the automobile sector. First of all, in the coal sector, well, uh, there is no future of the jobs there. The important thing is what happens after. Uh, and it is definitely a complex um, initiative and policies that are needed there. Investment policies, regional policies, industrial policies. At the same time in the coal sector, uh, just to mention at this point, there are much less jobs. It is, uh, it is uh, well, yeah, less than one tenth of of uh, the European uh, jobs that are linked to coal, in terms of coal plants and coal mines, it is not a big number, but it is concentrated in regions, and those regions are depending on it. The automobile industry is a different thing because there are um, well almost 14 million jobs um, in Europe that are depending on the automobile industry. Uh, those jobs uh, uh, will exist, although we don't know how many of them will exist because the, the sector uh, will go through an unprecedented um, uh, 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 transformation. Um, we can talk about that maybe later, but uh, uh, no, uh, now I skip uh, the concrete, uh, um, cases because that we will do after. I would only like to uh, mention one thing uh, to finish this part, that trade unions and social partners role, uh, it, it is absolutely important in this uh, just transition process. Social dialogue is key at all levels, national, sectoral, and uh, uh, plant level. Uh, at the same time, 
it is something new for social dialogue because social dialogue was normally focused on um, interest that were directly linked to work. They were focused on interests of those who were sitting at the negotiating table. But the climate is not sitting at the negotiating table. So, and the future generations are not sitting at the negotiation table. And the people in Africa are not sitting at the negotiating table in an industrialized society. So, in that sense, those interests need to some extent be included in these negotiations. And this is something really new. Uh, and of course, it's a challenge for social dialogue. Uh, and and it is also important that that uh, well, for trade unions, it is a new situation as well, because trade unions were uh, used to defend their members' interest in various ways, uh, and and also uh, taking care re for reorganization processes, changing work environments. So they, they had a vast experience in managing change, when managing change was dictated by the interest of capital, for example, globalization, supply chains, outsourcing, um, uh, different ways of reorganizations. Uh, they, they have vast experiences with that, how to defend workers' interests in these situations. But it was in the context of capital labor interest conflict. And these occasions, trade unions were often questioning uh, the purpose of change itself, because the purpose of change changing a work organization was often just about getting more profit. Uh, and trade unions had a legitimate um, uh, uh, reason to say that, stop, stop, stop. We don't want that change, or at least not to that extent. And now with the climate uh, policy and, and with the green transformation, it is again a new situation because now we have this change that is a common interest. It is not any more possible to say that, to question this change. At the same time, trade unions are also expected, and actually they do it as well, to push this change forward, more climate ambition. But at the same time, at the workplace level, more climate ambition means more pressure. In the coal industry, if, if trade unions in the coal industry would a goal for more climate policy target that would mean that they want to urge the process of of um, yeah um, kind of um, uh, that their jobs are being uh, vanished and then the automobile industry also so higher emission standards for cars are putting more pressure on work and and harder uh, uh, conditions. Uh, so that means in these cases, it is not uh, obvious that trade unions are supporting that change. Uh, in, in Normally they do, but in a reluctant way. It is often uh, mentioned in the literature that they have a hedging position. So kind of seeing what best can come out for their members uh, under the current situation. So. Uh, we also see a difference between um, a higher level trade union, uh, higher trade union organization levels like international or national that are clearly uh, uh, having a priority for climate change, uh, climate policies and climate ambition, lower level and particularly unions in the sectors that are, are, are affected have a more reluctant position. So there is also a tension here and trade unions uh, need uh, uh, new strategies. So I stop it now. Uh, I hope it was not too long and uh, 
then um, let's go back to um, the screen. At least, oops, yeah. You were there. Okay. Okay. Many thanks yeah, for this thank uh, very interesting um, introduction. We already have uh, one question in the chat box. It's from Stefan Bossuet. Stefan, I don't know what you want. You could ask the question yourself. As there are little questions. So if you want, you can put on your mic and uh, ask the question. Yes, uh, yeah. Bella. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Kate Raworth uh, with her donut economics. Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, a month ago, there was uh, an article in The Guardian uh, announcing that Amsterdam was going to use uh, the donut economics uh, to, uh, while embracing uh, her theory. And uh, in that article, uh, Kate uh, mentioned that before, prior to the COVID uh, crisis, she has spoken with the European Commission uh, and they were very interested. But afterwards, uh, well, I don't know what the status is. I, I just wanted to know because the goals of the donut economics are exactly the same, or yeah. let's say 80, 90% the same of what the goals are of just transition. And she has a toolbox. A toolbox. Is there no interest uh, in, in to use the toolbox or uh, collaborate with her? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and uh, we also had, yeah, collaboration with, with Kate Rovers. Um, uh, she was presenting uh, her uh, donut um, uh, economy uh, theory and practice uh, at our conference that we organized here at the ETI. And it was, um, yeah, very well attended. So, like, more than 100 people from many different trade unions around. Uh, uh, the ETUC and ETUI. Uh, so we had a discussion uh, and uh, it was very much uh, well received. Uh, and and uh, it is because, of course, uh, we also recognize that uh, we are not only talking about climate change. Yeah, So that is kind of the uh, most uh, um, well, um, wouldn't say the import, most important, but at least most in the focus of attention. And certainly it is a big challenge, yeah? So to, to, to get uh, down with the emissions and, uh, and control, at least control the climate change. But uh, there are several other planetary limits. And this is where what are included in this donut that, that uh, that uh, it is biodiversity, it is uh, the food supply system, uh, and, and uh, there are uh, many other elements. We have one planet, yeah? So this is also, you cannot expand this planet, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so we have to fit our welfare and our well-being into these limits and it is possible but it needs uh, very well coordinated and comprehensive policies because it is not just climate policy it is not only employment policy it is social policy a new welfare concept as well just transition is just uh, around there so between uh, employment policy and welfare policy or both in a new framework and then, of course, a further question uh, is also uh, to what extent do we need growth uh, in order to keep um, uh, these welfare? And uh, there, that is, uh, well, at least for developed economies, because if we talk about uh, no growth or degrowth, then we only talk about the developed world because we cannot claim for the whole. Uh, it is impossible for Indonesia not to have growth. It is impossible uh, for India not to have growth. Uh, but uh, so that is another debate and it is certainly um, 
it's an open discussion. And for trade unions, it's also a difficult one because uh, the whole uh, trade union movement and, and uh, uh, workers' rights uh, were um, fought on the basis of a growing economy. So it was always a growing cake to be redistributed. And that was difficult enough. And even now it is very difficult. Uh, so to do that with a non-growing cake is much even more difficult, or at least it needs a totally new concept. And, and that is uh, very, very, that is still a debate further. I have to say the no growth, um, uh, agenda is not very popular among trade unions. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. And, and yeah, anyway. So. Thanks for this uh, answer. Uh, uh, we see here the, another question is coming in from the UK. Uh, I will read it to you. In the UK, trade unions, in UK, trade unions have supported very damaging projects, such as the expansion of Heathrow airports but said little about the loss of thousands of jobs in the solar PV sector uh, because th these cuts of jobs were most in small companies. How can unions support workers' rights, such as in the gig economy, rather than supporting the old, traditionally unionized sectors that need to go? Oh, difficult question. Yeah, and there were many questions in one. Uh, so. Uh, for example, about Heathrow, uh, at least what I know, that it is currently off the agenda, uh, which is probably one of the very few benefits of the COVID crisis, uh, because coming back to that shortly, uh, the benefits, so to say, benefits that we see now are not real benefits. They are not, I mean, in terms, of course, that emissions are down and, and um, environment is clean now. These are not sustainable. So it will not stay like that. And also that normally we cannot expect radical policies like that, uh, what we had now, so kind of a sudden stop of life. Uh, that would be certainly possible. So if we stop that and if we stay at home, everybody, then we get uh, to the zero carbon economy quicker, for sure. But that is that cannot work. So this is for his role because now at least in that and in other um, air traffic uh, related projects, uh, there is at least some new thing coming up that uh, that uh, that uh, that could be also for uh, having longer term effects. So that's about his role. But in a broader sense, yes, it's true that, uh, and it's a problem uh, uh, for trade unions as well, that uh, many of the new uh, the emerging jobs and also those that are linked uh, to the green economy are not necessarily good jobs. Uh, there is, of course, the gig economy. Uh, it is not really a result of climate policies. It is more a result of digitalization and technological change, but certainly a quickly expanding um, uh, economy with very poor working conditions and and often non-regulated activities. So our welfare state and employment policy framework is not yet up to date to, to, to uh, cope with the challenges of this economy. And here there is an urgent, uh, uh, well, uh, action uh, to be done. Uh, to make sure that that uh, those uh, they have also employee rights, and they are also um, well, uh, good uh, uh, working conditions there. Uh, there are efforts, particularly in the UK, but also in other countries, from trade unions to organise these workers, and there are some good um, uh, experiences with that. Uh, that will also certainly be the way uh, to more uh, 
um, newly emerging jobs, but it is of course a, a, a big challenge because uh, the, many of the old jobs were organized. Uh, and that that were the main power, strongholds of trade unions. So okay. with the economy shifting, trade unions need to rethink all that. Yeah? I think this yeah. is a <clears throat> very clear answer. If uh, also the unions have to follow the changing economy, I would now propose uh, Bela that we go to the second uh, shorter part of your presentation concerning the two examples. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, maybe I need, I don't know if I need the PowerPoint for that. If not, I just go ahead. Yeah, because uh, I think I only have tax there, so it's not, uh, hmm. yeah. So uh, at least at this point, I wanted to mention two uh, cases. Uh, the one is the coal, phasing out coal uh, in the economy that is certainly extremely important because uh, we shouldn't forget that still it is roughly 18% of uh, European emissions are linked to coal. So it's a huge uh, part. Uh, so that's why um, um, phasing out coal uh, uh, in the energy system is absolutely crucial. Uh, how this happens is of course um, difficult. It takes time. And it needs um, a just transition perspective and, and policies. And, and there are several ways. Uh, I would mention the case of Germany here, but uh, that is, of course, a huge um, uh, piece of uh, experience because on the one hand, you can talk about the rural region uh, that was very much uh, based on coal and steel uh, but it took them more than 50 years uh, from the 70s until 2018 that the last hard coal uh, mine uh, had been closed. Uh, and it was a very difficult process that, that, that had been lots of social dialogue uh, there, uh, industrial policies, regional policies, uh, for, in a way, there was a learning experience in the sense that at least for two decades, 70s and the 80s, nothing happened. They were just moving around and around. They didn't really realize that there is, um, uh, well, it is a lesson of its own, also for social dialogue, because they made this... Uh, uh, moving around in social dialogue. Everybody was supporting no change. Uh, but then it moved on uh, from the 90s on. Uh, and the concrete phase out of, uh, of uh, well, almost 20,000 jobs uh, in, in coal mining, hard coal mining, uh, was based on an on a agreement with the uh, German uh, mining and chemicals union on the one hand and the employers and the uh, regional government on the other hand, it was a comprehensive plan uh, how to um, phase out. It, from the very early stages of this uh, dialogue, it took um, 20 years until the last uh, coal job disappeared. So that is too long for now. Uh, but uh, after signing the agreement, it was 10 years. And they had a lot of um, employment policy tools. Uh, uh, there, there was no forced uh, layoff uh, happening. Uh, of course, early retirement was used uh, as long as uh, it was uh, possible uh, for, for younger workers, uh, miners, there were massive training programs uh, 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 opened uh, and, and also kind of active um, um, uh, management of this change. There were a special purpose um, societies uh, put up 
to deal uh, with uh, 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 the skills development and, and also job counseling of these people. Uh, it was also becoming a model case of how big company transformations, uh, 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 employment transitions can be managed. So that was one lesson, kind of the positive way how it happened. So this last phase, uh, the last decades, last decade of the rule uh, was a positive case. It is also positive actually, but we have no time for that, uh, to see how the region changed itself. Because now uh, it is the rural region, although it still has uh, structural uh, weaknesses, but it is actually a knowledge-based economy. It is away from coal. There is still steel there, uh, but there is much um, environmental technology there, uh, universities, and uh, so new concepts and new economy. And that, for in order that happens, uh, uh, investment programs were absolutely necessary. Uh, the other part of the case is the current phase out of coal from the German energy system. That means closing down the coal fired power plants and also the lignit mining in um, uh, other areas uh, that, that had been done uh, last year, uh, as you may have known, uh, it was called the, the uh, German uh, Coal Commission. Well, first of all, it was an exemplary case for social dialogue because all the important stakeholders were included uh, and, and all the aspects of the transition were, um, were uh, dealt with. So uh, what is the future of the regions? Uh, uh, how to um, manage the employment transitions? Uh, what investments? Uh, uh, would be needed to prop up uh, 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 the regions, particularly the regions uh, that are heavily affected in the east of the country, in eastern Germany, uh, that are only depending on coal. Uh, and so this had been done in a very um, good way. So in terms of procedural justice, so participatory justice, it was an exemplary case. The only problem with that is that the result is uh, rather disappointing. So 2038 uh, uh, as the end date uh, for phasing out coal uh, for a country like Germany is extremely unambitious. And uh, uh, it's uh, hopefully it will still be revised, but this is how it is now. So this is a case where there is an exemplary social dialogue with everything uh, related. Uh, to the transition included, but the result is a little bit disappointing. So that was uh, the German uh, call um, case. I would mention a company case um, quickly. The NL company in Italy, uh, it's uh, Europe's uh, biggest uh, energy multinational uh, with uh, 90,000 employees and uh, half of them in Italy. And the company declared to become the first green energy giant or energy multinational. So they have set their own target for zero carbon. And uh, they announced it. It is called the Future E plan. That means uh, the decommissioning and transformation of uh, 23 power plants in Italy. So that is a total overhaul and including also a shutdown of, of the majority of these uh, power plants. Uh, and yeah, so it is quite an ambitious, it's already ongoing. So I think it was um, four or five power plants that had already been shut down. And the uh, last one uh, will be shut down in, in 2029. Uh, so in a way, it is an ambitious project. Uh, the 
they, they dealt with, at the very beginning, trade unions were protesting that they were not consulted properly and they were not uh, consulted on time. Uh, finally, so, but then uh, the NL uh, management uh, uh, was uh, having a framework agreement with trade unions. They were establishing a dialogue. Uh, they had been concepts by trade unions also taken into account or at least consulted. Uh, and, and finally, trade unions were signing up to this uh, program uh, with, uh, with uh, well, a lot of schemes that are also partially can be seen as innovative, for example, how the employment uh, change is being managed with uh, internal company mobility schemes, uh, how early retirement is being used, how training uh, programs are used, how ap apprenticeship programs are used. For example, they had a program that is called the relay system where, where one apprentice and one older worker works together, uh, kind of put, putting the rally over uh, to the generation. So both are being employed, but uh, the, the older worker is kind of, uh, uh, training the younger worker. Uh, these kind of things. And then uh, what is also important there that uh, they also take care about the afterlife of of uh, the uh, closed uh, power stations. Uh, that means that they were putting up tenders uh, for investment projects uh, after decommissioning. Uh, so those plants were, the, the facilities will not disappear, they will be reused. There are very different activities that actually came up uh, 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 and yeah, so this also included uh, the involvement of regional authorities and regional partners. So it was kind of a comprehensive approach and yeah, in a way, at least uh, it is seen as a good case. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's very interesting that you also gave a case of a company <clears throat> and not only of uh, region. Uh, in the chat box, there's still one question here I can pose. Uh, the question is, what is your view on the future of global value change? A lot of the CO2 comes from global transport, but the future of developing countries also depends on this global value change. So I think this is a bit of a question on Corona deglobalization and what does it mean also for the developing countries? Yeah, I mean, uh, it is not only the corona that uh, is questioning uh, some of uh, these um, uh, value chains, but they are heavily affected. So if we only look at the case of the automobile industry, that is, as I mentioned, a very big part of the European economy. And it is a sector that is extremely relying on international value chains in terms of suppliers, different level of suppliers, and also um, um, companies and facilities uh, all over the world. Uh, when managing this transformation, of, for example, the automobile industry, the change into electrical cars, a new mobility concept is totally rewriting the work patterns, but it is affecting the entire value chain. So if you are scaling down uh, the combustion engine, for example, the diesel technology, uh, that affects the entire value chain. So that affects different countries uh, uh, and and in different countries, many, many, many suppliers. Uh, how this can be managed in a, well, 
fair way, it is still quite a big challenge because what we see is that uh, in the core countries where the company headquarters are, normally there is a good practice of dealing with these challenges. For example, at the German automakers, Volkswagen, Daimler, uh, BMW, they had already massive consultations uh, with trade unions and works councils uh, how to adopt the production system to the new realities and how to deal with employment, layoffs as well, but also uh, qualification programs, future projects. But, and it was relatively well done uh, in Germany, but they didn't really deal with the locations in Poland, in Czechia, in Hungary, in Slovakia, uh, Spain. Uh, it was very much focused on the core location. And this is still a challenge, how to make an international approach out of that. So this is one example for that. And that is uh, certainly uh, the car industry now is in a total uh, breakdown. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, in relation to the current um, um, uh, crisis, I don't, well, in, in, in many ways, there is a rethinking of, of, of uh, globalization, that globalization was running too far, and there is a phase of deglobalization. Certainly, there will be some. Much of that is also very political. Uh, dependencies between countries and among countries. Um, it will be a turbulent process. And uh, yeah, it also needs okay. certainly guidance. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> There's one last question uh, from our colleagues from uh, Croatia. Uh, Nicolina, are you there? And maybe you can ask the question yourself. If not, I will do it. Um, no. Okay, then I will ask a question. So she writes, thank you for emphasizing that green jobs should be good and unionized jobs. I'm very skeptical that this is possible in regions that have been heavily deindustrialized in the last 30 years. Do the unions have an idea how should just transition look like in the European periphery? if we know that institutional frameworks of our national states have so far been aligned with the EU policies that mis dismantled possibilities for any industrial development, let alone the green ones, where the investment for green jobs in the European periphery could come from? Hmm. Uh, yes, um, certainly the challenge is um, particularly big uh, for more peripheral countries? Well, uh, so first of all, the investment, many or a big part of the investment as in the past is coming from outside foreign direct investment. That was also that uh, was boosting the Central Eastern European countries uh, after they joined the EU, but even before they joined. So in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Hungary were benefiting on large scale foreign direct investments. New industries were built up. Uh, it didn't happen in an ideal way. Uh, but it was important. And there is, there are always policy tools these countries have to um, provide incentives for investments into, uh, well, particular activities or branches. So if there is a positive incentive for green investment of foreign 
direct uh, investors, then it would help. Uh, and there, is, there are also large-scale uh, European investment programs, and we can hope that uh, within the European Green Deal, the EU Invest Program uh, will also uh, facilitate uh, investments all over Europe and not only in the core countries. Uh, with the Juncker plan, uh, there was one shortcoming was that uh, much of the investment was actually uh, absorbed by the more developed uh, Western European countries and not too many projects uh, were successful in the East. So there are lessons to learn from there. And I would only point uh, one initiative that at European level where, where there is an active uh, promotion of um, help regions to cope with transition. There is the core transition platform. Uh, it is a consultative uh, body uh, that is uh, dealing with concepts and projects, uh, how uh, uh, core regions uh, can uh, manage their transformation. Uh, there is not too much um, uh, resource attached to this, but uh, there are European resources from different funds that can be used. And, and this would be probably uh, the, the other important uh, element that uh, the EU cohesion funds and regional funds would be better used for green investment projects. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for this answer. And I think indeed, um, Let's hope that the Green New Deal and also the Just Transition Fund in this <coughs> can provide <coughs> resources also for the more peripheric countries. So, <coughs> um, of course, uh, we only touched upon different aspects of Just Transition, but Bela, I want to thank you for this introduction. You gave a clear overview from where it comes from, the concept. It's, it's much older, I think, than most people think. Uh, and it's, I think, uh, it only has grown in importance the last years, especially now. So uh, I want to thank Bella for your contribution. I want to thank everybody participating in different countries from Europe. Um, <clears throat> and uh, please uh, watch the website of the Green European Foundation or Oracles. We are in touch with some other people for the next uh, inspiring talks. The plan is to have two extra talks on just transition the coming weeks. And besides, for people also interested in um, interested in mobility, today at six o'clock we also have from the Green European Foundation <clears throat> the next Green Post Corona talk with two ministers. The minister, the Austrian minister responsible for climate and mobility and also the minister of the Brussels region. Um, so I would say, as I say on the radio, stay safe and stay tuned. Bye.